it's a pleasure to be here in Singapore. Um, first time actually I'm in Singapore uh, in Formula One week. People tell me it's going to be the most exciting week. Um, I've, I've been to in, in Singapore and I certainly got a full taste of it with the traffic this morning. But uh, I managed to be here on time, so that's great. Um, I uh, will be um, doing a fine start chat with my president, Raja, Raja Manar, um, for a catch up in terms of what keeps him busy as the CMO of um, MasterCard, as well as what his views are um, with respect to our biggest challenges in the industry. But before we do that, uh, I'd just like to do a quick poll here. Who among you know or have heard of WFA before? Raise hands. Oh, it's not bad. It's getting better, actually. I'm doing these polls um, uh, regularly uh, here in Singapore, so we probably have something like 40%, which is, uh, which is a good start. But for the 60% who've never heard of us, let me just do a very quick, very fast intro into uh, WFA. And um, let me start by um, showing you um, a sort of very quick intro video in terms of our Globe Market Week in Lisbon uh, earlier this year. I'd like to welcome you to the Gold Market Week 2019 in Lisbon. Uh, I'd like to tell you that uh, this is going to be uh, the absolute record turnout for us uh, at any Gold Market Week in our 66 year history. And um, we're delighted to have you all here. someone like the World Federation of Advertisers, not only just to keep the score um, and keep us connected, but also help us shape the future uh, agenda. And that's why I've been a, a big supporter uh, from uh, even when I first started here uh, and talking uh, in Beijing. Uh, and here I am giving my last speech as CMO um, here in Portugal. Absolutely hate forums where people are posturing. Like, oh come on! I really, I want. What I want to know is, what's it really like? What's going great? What are you doing? What's interesting? You know, how can we collaborate? How can we share? And I have just gotten a ton of that this week, so I've loved it. Have fun. <laughs> I always have fun. should come to Global Market Week because it's very hard to get away from your desk and out of your little bubble of what you're doing in your company and mix with your peer group and be inspired by your peer group. You come here to learn, to listen, um, to borrow great ideas, to build on them and it's a fantastic community of people and if you're not in it, you're missing out. So this was Global Market Week 2019 in Lisbon, and here's the scoop. Global Market Week 2020 will be in Singapore, okay? So March 31st to April 3rd, and the conference on April 2nd, okay? Let me say a few words in terms of uh, who we are as an organization. So WFA is the only network of brand marketers, so client-side marketers. We uh, bring together um, roughly 90% of ad spend through 6,000 marketers across 16 different categories. Um, and we have a global footprint. Um, we have national associations in the top 60 ad markets from the US to Brazil, from China to Australia, from France to South Africa. Um, that network um, represents roughly 90, 97% of ad spend worldwide. We have a, a purpose in life, and that holds in two, cent in two words, better marketing. So we stand for more effective, more efficient, and more sustainable marketing. That's what our purpose is all about. We have corporate members, 105 at the latest count, many of them being present here today, um, and we're growing at roughly 10% per year again this year. 
And how can we help you, brand marketers at WFA? It's through three things, actually. One is knowledge sharing. At a time where we see change and on a scale and at the speed where individual brand owners, even the largest, cannot um, uh, compete. So we, we provide knowledge. We make connections. We offer uh, networks with peers um, across the industry. And the third thing is we do leadership. There are a number of challenges, and we'll talk about them with Raja in our industry today, which are simply too big to solve individually. And they are going to be defining our industry in the future. And in order to be solving them, we need to collective leadership. And that's why we need people like Raja Rajamanar, who is our global president at WFA, and with whom I will be talking about that agenda. Raja, can I please call you on stage? Thanks, Thank you. So, Raja, thank you for joining us here in, um, in Singapore. It's good to catch up. We haven't seen each other uh, in some time now. Um, and um, I just want to, to see um, uh, your views on, on, on the region, on the Asia region. I think this is your, your first marketing conference in Singapore so far. Um, um, so what are you seeing right now in, in Asia? You know, people talk about uh, you know, um, um, headwinds in terms of the economy, etc. And what are your sort of perspectives longer term? But before I get into that, is this place hazy or am I... Uh, is the haze come from outside inside or are people smoking something here? <laughs> I, I hope this is a safe environment. Uh, I, I can barely see anyone of you out there. Uh, but I would say that you know, as far as Asia is concerned, uh, this is clearly uh, the fastest growing region in the world. Uh, amazing potential. The population is all here. And it's not only the, can you guys see me? Okay, so not only is this the fastest growing region with a humongous base of population, it's also a very youthful population here. So which means for generations ahead, the market size and the market potential is practically guaranteed. And the kind of innovation that is coming from this region, I would say is probably way ahead of what is there in the rest of the world, uh, which is phenomenal. And also, uh, there are powerhouses in various segments that are really establishing whether it is in areas like uh, mobility. I think, for example, one simple look at the mobile phones in this part of the world versus what you see either in Europe or even in the US, these phones are much more sophisticated, much more economical, much more functional. That's just one very basic example. And if you look at the proprietary kind of ecosystems which are coming out, those of you from China, you know how, for example, WeChat is there end to end, and uh, they can put to shame any other company from any other part of the world in terms of the sheer scale, the functionality, the user interfaces, and so on. The kind of innovations coming in the field of artificial intelligence and augmented reality, virtual reality, gaming, esports, area by area, this place, this region is setting pace for the rest of the world, and I think uh, probably it's number one priority for every single multinational national worth its salt. So that's what my view is as far as this region is concerned. And from my perspective, from my company's perspective, which is MasterCard, there's a huge priority for us. And uh, Raja, how does that materialize from a MasterCard perspective? So given that Asia is your number one perspective, does that, no, how, how does that translate in terms of um, brand building, in terms of um, presence in the markets? And how are you uh, getting prepared for, for that growth? So it's a kind of a multi-dimensional effort, right, and multiple fronts. You start working closely with the governments because many of these countries, for example, like India and China and Thailand, etc., they are still in the evolutionary journey. And the evolution is taking very different shapes in different countries. It's not one standard that's getting set across the place. Uh, and so to make sure that there is interoperability, that the policies are formulated in a way that encourages uh, people to adopt digital payments on the one hand, and to make sure that it is also seamless for the providers across the board to participate. And I know right now, for example, some of these countries have digital payments less than 5%. 95% is non-digital. So that's a humongous opportunity to really grow into. And 
there are significant advantages, not only of efficiencies uh, for the, you know, cash actually costs you money to handle. There are errors, there is fraud, there is anonymity, which leads to all kinds of crazy uh, things happening, like, you know, drug trafficking and human trafficking, all these bad things. So I think when you look at digital, it ensures that the economy is white and not a shadow economy and so on. So we work with the governments from a policy perspective. We work with startups as well as other partners to create uh, products and services that cater to the local audiences very clearly. From a brand building point of view, uh, this is another huge thing. For us, we are a global brand, and we want to make sure that the brand is not only recognized in each one of these countries, uh, but it is also uh, blending with the local culture so that this is not a foreign brand in my country, but it is a brand which caters to me. It feels homely. It's very native to this particular environment and culture. So we've been consciously building our brand out here. We're investing hugely in this uh, region in, across many countries and a very strong presence, both not only here in Singapore, but across many countries within the region. So it, it's been a lot of exciting, um, how do you say, explorations happening, investments happening, and we are getting a terrific momentum in this region. Um, and Raja, maybe a word of about um, uh, marketing talent, as you as you um, build the the marketing teams in across the region, um, um, what are you seeing in terms of marketing talent? Do you do you find the, the sort of right talent? Are you are you even seeing some of that talent move move up to um, more global roles? Now, how, how are you nurturing that talent? See, when you talk about the availability of talent, if you take a step back from a marketing perspective you need to figure out what do you expect marketing talent to do and deliver. Today, the role of a marketer is completely different than what the role was even five years back. How so? So first and foremost, in the past, if you are very good at classical aspects of marketing, the four Ps of marketing, the brand positioning, the purchase process, the consumer psychology, market research, etc., then you are golden. But today, it is hopelessly inadequate. Marketing has really become very data-driven, and it is empowering marketers in an unbelievable way. And with the coming in of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all this, it is not just jargon. It has got real impact to how marketers do marketing. So they need to understand data. In the past, typically, marketers would come from the creative side of the house. That is totally inadequate now. You need to understand the quantitative side of the house. You need to understand technology. And unless you understand these new technologies, in fact, uh, you know, many companies, the chief marketing officers have bigger technology budgets than their corresponding chief information officers. In that situation, when you are given this opportunity A, and the money to spend, you need to really understand that field, otherwise you'll get left behind, so you need to understand technology. You need to understand how to establish a credible causal relationship between your marketing actions on the one hand and the business outcomes on the other hand. Typically when you're talking to marketers and you ask them, and when a CEO or a CFO asks a marketer, okay, you are spending $100 million, what did we get in return? The typical answer is our awareness has gone up, our brand is stronger, the predisposition is great, the net promoter score is great. That does not cut it. They are not looking at this marketing mumbo jumbo. What they need is, how is it driving my top line? How is it enhancing my margins? And how is my business bottom line growing? And how is my position in the market getting stronger? And we're erecting moats around our brand and around our company or not. They are looking to marketers to actually do this. And when marketers faced with these questions, if they don't have the right answers and they look like deer caught in headlights, that really erodes their credibility. With the result of which, a lot of companies are doing away with the roles of CMOs. And you know, whether it is Coca-Cola, you know, these are not some small industrial companies which are doing away with the roles of CMOs and changing the nature of how marketing is done in these companies. So for example, many companies, the four Ps of marketing are not with marketing. Somebody does products, somebody does distribution, somebody does pricing, and somebody else does promotion. Then what the hell do marketers do? in these companies. It's, it's a very you know, serious existential situation for the classical marketers. 
So they have to up their skills like crazy. So what we are looking today, and not when I say we, I'm not just talking about MasterCard, I'm talking about as a marketing community, the talent that you require have to be truly general managers, and these general managers should know technology, they should know data, they should know finance, they should be quintessential businessmen with a deep-rooted understanding of uh, marketing as a specialization. You don't want marketing specialists, but you want generalists who have a deep marketing expertise as well. So that's how uh, it, it is, and finding such talent is not easy. It's not that it doesn't exist. If such talent exists, most of the cases, they either start their own companies, or they're joining startups, they go to investment banks where the financial opportunities are different, and they don't normally pick up marketing jobs. So to inspire them, attract them, and to stay with the company is a huge challenge, and this is what is keeping me awake every single night. Thank you, Raja. And uh, so that's the stuff which keeps you awake at night, but the stuff which excites you most as you look at MasterCard and the way it connects to uh, people living in a digital era. What, what do you find particularly exciting as you look into the future? See, two things. Firstly, from the field of marketing, and secondly, from the aspect of MasterCard. The field of marketing is getting extremely, extremely exciting. Right, in terms of the kind of technological and data-driven changes that are coming down the pike, if you can take advantage of that while respecting consumer rights for their privacy and so on, you can create magic, which was impossible to do as recently as eight to 10 years back. So today you have that opportunity. The ability to come to insights that were before not possible because today you got systems where unorganized data, asymmetric data, can be collated, aggregated, and patterns read into it, and insights identified. This kind of a capability didn't exist eight to 10 years back. And this capability is not in the purvey of very few large companies. It's highly democratized. Irrespective of the size of your company, you can actually do it. That's one part of it. When you look at things like a augmented reality, virtual reality, and uh, the 3D printing, 5G, these are enablements that can help you engage with consumers in unbelievably effective ways. Internet of Things is coming. Uh, I, the wearables are becoming a phenomena much bigger by the day. All these give you opportunities for multiple touch points with consumers, and it's extremely exciting. So I think I would, I would not uh, want to be in any other time in marketing than today. So it's really exciting and inspiring from that point of view. Now, from MasterCard perspective, it's, we are at a very interesting part of our own journey. Historically, we used to be looking at ourselves as a technology company and a payments brand. So we underwent a significant transformation over the last six years where we said, we are indeed a technology company, but we are a lifestyle brand. We moved a lot away from classical advertising into experiential marketing. So we have been investing very heavily in experiences. We look at the entire consumer landscape around the world and say that we need to engage with consumers by providing them with experiences that money cannot buy, but you can get it only because you have a MasterCard. So we have moved a lot of our marketing budgets into sponsorships, and leveraging sponsorships and other assets to curate experiences at scale and economically. In this day and age, when you try to tell as a brand your story, nobody cares to hear, and there is a trust deficit. But if you give experiences to the consumers that are absolutely mind-blowing, they will tell the brand story to their network, and that is credible. So it's a classical word of mouth, but on steroids and powered by digital. So this is what we have been actually driving, so much so now we are creating our own experiences instead of just relying on experiences that are already out there. As an example, we launched five restaurants, very, very upscale restaurants, four of them in downtown Manhattan, in Tribeca, for example. And these restaurants are very upscale, extraordinary kind of, uh, what do you call, uh, it, it, these, these are really fascinating when you go and uh, you know, have a meal at one of those restaurants. So we are recreating some of the best restaurants around the world, bringing them in, into Manhattan, in this example, and we have launched them. It's proving to be a great big hit for us. So we're getting into experiences phenomenally all over the place. We have created technology platforms, and we are getting deeper and deeper into consumer lifestyle. We are into fashion 
fashion, uh, we are into shopping, we are into music, we are into movies, uh, we are into sports. So we have identified 10 different passion points, sustainability, philanthropy. For example, in philanthropy side, we started doing something with Stand Up to Cancer, uh, raising awareness and funds uh, to cure, to find cures for cancer. And at this point already, we have, have seven drugs that have been discovered at the molecule level and approved by the FDA in a record, uh, I would say, eight or nine years uh, in total. Uh, typically, otherwise, it takes 12 years for one cancer drug to be discovered. So we have brought in new methodologies for the discovery process, partnering with a company called Stand Up to Cancer. So these kind of social initiatives that are firmly embedded in the core business model is changing the way you do marketing and how do you endear yourself to the consumers and connect with them authentically and credibly. So these are the kind of things that we are doing. And uh, the brand right now, in fact, in a few years back, Brand Z used to rate us at number 87 in the list of 100 most valuable brands. Today we are at number 12. In a short period, we sort of started moving very fast. And in the US, we are at number 10. So we are a top 10 brand. So the momentum and the movement has been fantastic. We are growing much faster than any of the other uh, competitors we have out there. And uh, the journey has been fascinating, and it's getting more interesting and exciting now. Mm. And Raja, maybe, maybe a word about uh, the launch of the Sonic brand of MasterCard in a, in a, in a context where voice platforms are increasingly important in the, in the connection between between brands and people. What's, what's your view in terms of what, how those voice assistants will uh, impact that relationship and how do you position the MasterCard brand in that, in that um, new environment? Yeah, see, historically, if you see consumers used to interact uh, with any device using their hands and eyes predominantly. They enter something with a keyboard or by tapping stuff on the screen and then they get answers visually back to them most cases, right? When something comes back at you visually, you're engaging your eyes, you're reading, you're looking, and the whole screen can have multiple things appearing. Like when you're searching for something, you find that there are no, uh, whether organically uh, ranked or paid, what do you see, various things, and you can decide what you want to buy. You can think about it, you click on it, and then the purchase happens. That is getting short-circuited, and the entire purchase funnel is getting transformed thanks to these uh, smart speakers. So you have got the Alexa. So, hey, Alexa, uh, I need to buy a soap. Now, in audio, you can only process one at a time in a sequential way. Unlike visual on a screen, you can see multiple things, and you can see this, you can see this. Audio, it's singular, it's linear, and you hear one at a time. So whatever Alexa says, the, the scary thing at one level is people are saying, and this is a research we worked together on, which shows clearly that people believe that what Alexa or a Google Home is recommending to them is indeed a great choice for them, which means there is an influencer now coming in between that did not exist as powerfully and as strongly before. So as a marketer, how do you deal with it on the one hand? Second, this is not just the smart speakers. You're getting connected cars where the interaction action is completely voice-based. Internet of things, you will start talking to your refrigerator, your dishwasher, your washing machine, God bless you, you'll be talking and having conversations with these idiotic machines, but that's how it's going to be. Okay, fill yourself, refill, order something back. You're giving everything voice-based. Then you've got wearables. So like the Star Trek types, you know, you press something here and then you talk and then that connects to something else. So wearables are becoming as well very big and I have seen a number of prototypes where you start talking to your wearables, your clothes, your watches, your rings and etc. So the main mode of interaction and purchase is going to be voice-based. Now, we have got, for example, a brilliant brand which is very easily recognized around the world with those two circles in red and yellow. If I don't have a visual real estate in this entire voice-based interaction, how do I show my brand? So you need to have a brand that is represented via sound. We call it sonic branding. So at the beginning of this year, in February this year, we launched our sonic brand, which means you need to have an identity for your brand that's based on sound. This is not a jingle. 
This is not a signature at the end of an ad. These are 70, 80 years old phenomena. What we are talking about is cutting edge. It's a new age kind of a stuff that we are doing. A complete sonic brand architecture with several layers of identifiers. So just as an example, I'll talk to you very briefly about three layers. It'll take just two minutes. The first layer we say is a melody. It's a 30 second melody that is very pleasant, that is memorable, that is neutral, that is hummable, that is versatile to any situation, and that's also versatile and adaptable to different cultures. This 30 second melody to create it, it took us two years. And that's what we have actually started with that. And this features in all our ads and uh, events and uh, trade shows and so on. Then uh, we have got, I get a message here that my chair is looking mm -hmm. very dangerous. They said, swap your chair. OK, I'll sit in the front and hopefully I will not fall out of my chair. Or should I go and stand? Why don't I stand? I don't want to fall down. So uh, see, things are falling apart. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, basically what happens is in this scenario, this is one level of identity. The second one is, we call it a sonic signature, which is a subset of these 30 seconds, where at the end of every ad, you have a signature, but the sound signature, it's three seconds. When you listen to three, three seconds, it looks exactly like the 30 seconds. There is a continuity in the melody. Then a third layer, we call it is acceptance sound. Whenever a MasterCard transaction goes through successfully, either on your digital device or at a physical point of sale, that makes a sound. That sound is 1.3 seconds long. And when you listen to that 1.3, it encapsulates exactly the same melody as the three seconds, as the 30 seconds. Now using this core, we created what we call as a sonic DNA. And this DNA, leveraging it, now we are trying to build a whole amount of music around it to get into the pop culture. So when you listen to that music, it sounds like any other music, but there is a beautiful integration of the MasterCard Sonic Melody, and we are hoping to launch our first music album, uh, which is being written and composed by some celebrity composers and writers, uh, and we are hoping to release it in March 2020. So now we'll have you know, that playing on Spotify and all the usual kind of channels where people listen to. So the point being that brands have to become very conscious that they are going to be working with a different set of uh, or a different purchase funnel where the traditional real estate is not going to be there, that is visual, but it's going to be voice-based, and they need to create identity appropriately, and realizing that only one thing can show up at a time when it comes to audio sense. It's going to be fascinating, and that's the reason why we actually now have a strategy, we call it multi-sensory uh, branding. So we are launching the taste of MasterCard. That's how we have come up with these five restaurants, and we have announced the launch of uh, a macaron uh, set that we are launching. Uh, and this is done, being produced for especially by Ladure uh, out of France. And so two flavors created specifically with MasterCard uh, and uh, the taste of passion and the taste of optimism, that's what we call it. And one, of course, is red and the other one is yellow. So we are really going and trying to envelope <laughs> and connect with consumers in a zillion ways. And uh, th this is how we register ourselves. I'm very interested by the macaron. Where do, where do you find the macaron, the new one? Yeah, it's going to be launched next month in the US, but it'll be going global. Uh, the rollout will start after that. You can buy it from priceless.com, or you go to any Ladore uh, uh, counters, not the pop-up stores of Ladore, but the main stores. You'll yeah. actually be able to find it there. Fascinating. And these are exclusively you know, MasterCard cr uh, created for us. So we're having fun, uh, as you can see. But these are not just for fun. These are things which are deeply meaningful. We have done a ton of neurological research, all kinds of research around this to make sure that these appeal to the consumers, and consumers will start forming that identity in their mind, yeah. that affinity in, in their minds for the brand, and so on. Yeah. Marketers become ever more polyvalent, from music to cuisine to, to data. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Um, let's now move to um, to the industry agenda. No, um, when uh, when you look at the sort of big challenges we need to be solving yeah. as we look into the future from an industry perspective, and and maybe we start with 
with one hot button issue, which is um, online safety and brand safety. Uh, we've, um, we've seen um, um, uh, press coverage on this for the last two years, almost incessantly, um, you know, starting with, um, I think back then was the two years ago, um, the, the Times of London with um, 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 brew chip companies ending up on ISIS uh, terrorist websites, and then the Christchurch murder, and then um, the latest um, uh, pedophiles you know, misusing YouTube in order to connect. Um, um, so the industry has seen a string of those um, incidents um, where, where brand owners have been um, increasingly come under pressure in terms of what their role is. So question to you, Raja, first of all is, where do you where do you, do you think brands have actually responsibly um, with respect to to those um, to those issues around brand safety and online safety? See, brand safety is uh, you know mighty critical for any brand worth its salt, right? You want to make sure that your brand is showing up in the right places, and every brand defines what is a safe environment, what's a safe space for that particular brand. Uh, and that has been one issue for the brands. And some of the brands, including MasterCard, for example, we have shut off things, saying that we don't want to use this particular social media platform because uh, we had some instances where it appeared in the wrong places. We don't want to be on a terrorist site or a pornographic site or stuff like that. That will completely undo what you're trying to do for your brand. You're trying to nurture and build your brand. And when you appear in places like this, it totally destroys the brand credibility. And worse, you are funding those sites owners because they get the revenue back as well, part of the revenue, add revenue back to them. So it, one simple solution is to block it off, but that is not really a solution. It's a temporary measure that you take at best. So I think, you know, uh, Bo, uh, particularly from the WFA side, I think, you know, no single brand can take on and then say, hey, you social media platform, whether you're Google or Facebook or whoever you are, uh, it's very difficult to tackle and you know, implement a complete change or enforce a total change. That's where I think as brand owners, we have to come together, which we did under the auspices of WFA, and uh, then have as a complete group, as a community of brand owners to have these conversations with the social media giants, so to speak. And since then, there has been some positive movement, movement which is good. Uh, is it enough? No. Is it moving in the right direction? Yes. Is it moving at the right pace? No. Is a lot needs to be done? Absolutely, yes. Mm. And uh, I think it is very critical. Now, the other part of it is, if you look at the membership of WFA alone, and correct me if I am wrong, Stefan, I believe we have got about a collective spend of a trillion dollars plus as advertising budget of all the members put together. Now, trillion dollars is a significant amount of money for anyone to take care of. It is also important for brand owners to realize that their purchasing power also brings a social responsibility. If you look at the culture, if you look at everything that is happening around, we have got a responsibility to make sure that the culture is not sort of stereotyping things or perpetuating things in, uh, you know, in unflattering ways for certain communities or for certain segments of uh, the population. We need to take care of it, but also equally, we have to make sure that the channels that we have power over, like the social media channels, have to be a safe environment for all the people. So if you have live streaming of shootings that are happening in Auckland or wherever it is, that is completely unacceptable. So it's not only the brand safety that is critical, it's also the societal safety, and that's what we have been working, particularly through the WFA, uh, with these social media giants and trying to get some uh, controls in place. It's not an easy solution. If it was easy, it would have been done by now. But I think we are on that journey, and uh, I think uh, we are taking the right steps. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I should be adding to that that we will be announcing in Ad Week New York next week um, initial uh, steps which have been taken by the group. Um, uh, the, uh, so there's, there's a collective effort which includes Facebook, Twitter, Google, as well as major brands and all the holding companies in terms of identifying very concrete steps 
in order to make a difference. So it's not about boiling the ocean. We all know how complicated that is. It is about making sure that we can take a number of steps in terms of process, in terms of accountability, which get us to finally get a, a grasp uh, um, um, on this issue. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll be communicating around this next week. The, the other um, industry challenge I want to talk about uh, with you, Raja, is around um, measurement. So we have, 2019 is actually seeing an inflection point in the sense that for the first time ever, digital ad spend globally is going to, to pass the threshold of 50%. So 50% of, of ad spend globally is actually now digital, of which, you know, simple, simple arithmetic, of which roughly 60% controlled by what is known as du duopoly. Yeah? Um, um, and we, yet we see actually very little progress on the measurement piece. What, what's your take on this? Um, uh, remember, one of the earlier points I made is how marketers have to credibly establish the linkage between business outcomes and their marketing investments. For that, to be able to do and establish clear ROIs, they need the right data to operate with. And from that point of view, you need to be able to measure what's going in, what's coming out, and what is coming out, is it something which is correlatable to the business results? I think we have challenge. Many, many, many companies are struggling with this problem at multiple levels. But one of those levels is where you need to be able to get data transparently and accurately and in a timely fashion from the various digital players. So today what happens if you look at one social media platform, I get data only from that social media platform, pertaining to that platform. Then I have got another platform. The data that I get from that is completely restricted to that particular platform because these are all walled gardens, so to speak. Then what happens is, how do you measure the effectiveness from a cross-platform point of view? How do you measure redundancy and avoid redundancy? There are no credible mechanisms right now to be able to do that. And that's where I think the uh, coalition at the industry level that we are having and the task force that has been formed uh, to have cross-platform measurements is something which is fantastic. And big companies like Procter & Gamble and Unilever, they're all part of uh, this entire coalition. Mars and uh, you know, uh, so on, MasterCard, of course, is part of it. And I think that's hopefully it's going to give us some some good uh, metrics with which we know what is happening. And also the fact that the TV companies are also now joining. It, so it is not just within the uh, new age digital platforms only, but you're talking about the TVs of the world as well. So you get a holistic picture in a much more integrated fashion that you can make sense out of and make sure that your campaigns are run in the most productive fashion with minimal wastage and a lot of credibility uh, of these measurements. So I think this uh, uh, you know, uh, media measurement Council, I think it's going to be mm. uh, extremely valuable. Yeah, it's, there's interesting. So you were talking about the economic dimension and the importance for 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 brands to to have better accountability ultimately for for what they spend and the outcome. There's also an interesting dimension in terms of what it means for people, for us to be able to better calibrate ultimately what we what we serve to people, um, given given the overall perception that there's an ad overload and that uh, brand owners aren't sufficiently um, understanding who they reach. Um, maybe just say a word on this. So there is. Um, Raja is ref referencing a group called the Cross Media uh, Measurement Group, which brings together all the major digital platforms, half a dozen of the world's largest clients, and a number of holding companies, as well as um, ISBA, ANA, which are UK and US Association, um, and uh, WFA to help define global principles for cross-platform measurement. So this is this is. Very early days, we hope to have a consensus on the principles. And those, that consensus hopefully will then become a blueprint for um, markets to be uh, running um, um, cross-platform measurement systems which meet their needs. But potentially we're seeing here the, the beginning of a solution um, in an industry which has changed beyond recognition and which is still measured like it was measured uh, 20 years ago. Yeah? Correct. Um, the, the, the final um, 
big challenge. We could have talked about many other big challenges in the industry, but, but I want to talk about diversity and gender in our industry. You know, we, we pride ourselves of being an industry which is hip, which is you know, connected to people, which is looking at the future, which you know, resonates with individuals. And yet we are a, at times depressingly um, undiverse. Um, uh, an old-fashioned industry in the way we showcase gender and diversity in general. Um, what are your thoughts on this, uh, Raja? Yeah, so I think in, even in this day and age, the level of stereotyping, for example, of women in ads is quite pathetic, right? And uh, firstly, many companies still are very focused on men. Uh, and where they are focused on women, they show them in very traditional, secondary, subordinate, menial kind of roles or just for glamour. You don't show them in real sense. But the key thing is, this kind of depiction in the ads and similar depictions in the movies are the ones which shape culture. So back to my point about marketers have to be socially responsible as well, we need to change that. So therefore, things like this unstereotype alliance that has been uh, formed under WFA is trying to set the balance right. On gender balance specifically, for example, I'll give you a MasterCard case. Six years back when I joined, uh, one out of six, which is roughly 16% of all uh, employees of MasterCard within marketing and communications area were women. Five out of six, other way putting it, is men. If you look at my business model, 80% plus of all the purchase decisions are actually taken by women. So why the hell do I not have an organization which reflects a similar ratio? And fast forward now, Today, we have got about 75% of my entire team is women. And this is not just at the junior levels, it's right up to my direct reports level. So that's something. And you see the kind of change that has happened in the quality of our creatives. And you know, there is, a, for example, in North America, we measure something called gender, gender equality measure. It's called the GEM score. And GEM score, we are hitting the ball out of the park every single time with all the ads that we're creating, where you actually show women as the, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, in the, in the lead character, so to speak, and being the bosses, being themselves, and very uh, empowered, and which is, which is a real reflection of what the real world is there. You're not being patronizing in this whole thing. You're just depicting the reality the way it is, and uh, do that and, uh, rather than show them in some, you know, uh, funny kind of a situation. And uh, the stats around this are phenomenal, and the results are very evident. What happens is when you show women the right way and you're appealing to women for all the purchase decisions, the results are actually very, very uh, you know, superior. And that should be blindingly obvious, but for some reason, it's not being practiced that way, sadly. And talking about the other diversity as well, you know, every country now or in every region has become a melting pot of cultures. And you need to have that representation from across different cultures, not from democratic political point of view, but from a sheer marketing point of view. Who would understand their culture better than people belonging to that culture? So I think you need to have a multicultural kind of an approach to any company. And I feel very proud at MasterCard, for example, the CEO and the CMO, we are Indians. And we are running, and I, you know, uh, the, I am running the function, marketing and communications, he's running the whole company. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it feels very reassuring for the whole employees to say, look, this is not a typical kind of a thing where an American company means you have so-and-so. A person who looks like this is a standard CEO. And the company is doing bad because we have got such diversity in the company. We are one of the most diverse companies. This company has got one of the highest total shareholder returns in the last 10 years. It's, it's, you know, I, I wish I joined the company 10 years back. I only joined six years back. But if you look at from 10 years back till now, the company's stock price has gone up by uh, 24 times or something of that sort. And even in the six years that I have been here, it has moved multiple times over. Mm. So the point is the company's performance is fantastic when you really have that advantage of diversity, get different perspectives in a real, sincere, authentic way, and then manifest it into the practices of your business or into the creation of your campaigns and so on.
And, and Raja, how are you translating this vision for diversity, which you drive very forcefully in, in Mastercard? How do you translate that with respect to, to your agencies and, and, and those who help you? So, uh, for example, we have got our agency is McCann, right? That's the agency of record. And uh, we have formed a comp uh, agency, I would say it's a, uh, a company within the agency dedicated only to Mastercard called XBC. Now, the president of XBC is a woman. She happens to be an Indian woman, but that was not the criteria. The key thing is it's purely based on merit. And the quality of output that is coming from there, absolutely outstanding. So we talked to the agency and said, that if you guys are coming up with creative, ins creative outcomes, you need to have insights. So you need to have people who understand these various cultures. So on the one hand, you've got a geographic spread around the world. But even in the head office, you really want to make sure that folks understand the cultural nuances and they're able to come up with things which are very appealing. Small, small things can really connect so nicely to the consumers. There is a huge difference between 99% and 100%. And that's massive, I can tell you that. So it's not just perfectionism, which is bad words these days, but it's not perfectionism. It's about hitting the right nerve center with, and touching the finest nuances of this cultural, uh, you know, uh, the cultural richness. If you can tap into it appropriately and authentically, it can be awesome. Thank you, Raja. We, we're getting closer to the end of our chat. Maybe a word about Globe Mark to Week 2020? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, one of the things we have, I have personally found, and I speak to a number of my CMO peers from other companies as well, is getting together as a global community uh, at least once in a year, if not more, and exchanging notes, exchanging thoughts, identifying industry-specific areas, learning from each other. We've got so many playbooks that WFA is creating, right? And I have personally found, though I have been in the field of marketing for 35 years, some of the playbooks that have been created from WFA have become such excellent reference even to me and to my team members. We are creating all that and next year, this year it happened in uh, Lisbon. I think you showed the video before I came on stage. And next year it's going to happen in Singapore itself. And I think it will be a fantastic opportunity for you all to try and be a part of it and learn from your global uh, peers and counterparts around the world and uh, see what's happening. You know, Because some countries are slightly ahead in some areas, some countries are slightly ahead in different areas. So learning from each other and as a community, if we had support each other, if we advance collectively and tackle the issues collectively, I think that's going to be truly awesome. So I would really highly encourage and welcome you all uh, to be a part of that Global Marketer Week that's going to happen. is in, in April, right? Yeah, exactly. So you put in your diaries, April 2nd. Okay, It's Fairmont Hotel here in Singapore. Um, and as, as Raja said, this is going to be a client-side marketer conference. So, so you're going to be hearing from the brand owners and how they see the future. We've announced actually uh, last week the first two speakers, one of them featuring here. We brought him over to Singapore. Uh, and the other one is Mark Pritchard, uh, the CMO of uh, Procter & Gamble, who've been announced. And there are going, going to be a few more announcements in the coming weeks. And so we look forward to seeing you there. And we have, we're going to partner with our good friends of Marketing Matters uh, in the run-up to that conference. So I'd like to thank them too. Raja, thank you very much. Raja Ramanar, CMO. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.